I'm not going to keep everybody waiting. Um, we're going to kick off this uh, training session here. We're going to be going over glance preemption and sort of how it works and how to demo it. <clears throat> yeah, if I can just ask everybody to put themselves on mute um, to make sure that we don't get any noise in the background. So today we're going to go over what is glance preemption. I'm not going to go over quite so much detail about this. I'm actually just going to go through one of our videos to show that. Um, obviously, you know, when we sell the systems, we have a whole presentation and all the rest. But what I wanted to do was go over the glance user interface to give you guys a, a more in-depth knowledge of how to use it and how to navigate. So what we're going to do within the Glan system is we're going to be looking at the map display, what you can do within the map display, where the vehicles are, where their intersections are, if there are any issues. Then we're going to go and look at level two display of traffic signals and of vehicles. Then we're going to go into level three, which is the more detailed view. And finally, we're going to go through the reporting section. And the reporting section is going to be all of the different um, reports that we have for preemption and going through that in, in quite a bit of detail because what we've seen is a lot of the fire chiefs uh, that we're selling to really value the data that, uh, that we're getting from, from these reports. So some of you guys are new to Glance preemption. And what does it do? How does it work? One of the easiest ways of explaining it is actually just going through one of these videos and showing you um, what Glance Preemption does and how it works and the different devices that go in. All of these videos are on YouTube. And um, I believe that uh, my sales guys have all got memory sticks that they're handing out to to all of you that have all these videos on them as well so you can have them locally saved on uh, on your computers so the first thing is obviously the whole idea behind preemption is to give green lights to emergency vehicles and the way our system works is there's no input needed from anyone. It's a device that gets installed into the fire truck. As soon as his emergency lights turn on, it starts requesting green lights. So as he's driving towards the signal, it's going to start requesting the green lights. The light. system is engineered to initiate a request for green lights. On this emergency run, the route has multiple intersections set to immediately respond to the request for green lights and begin to intelligently allow vehicles to move forward along the arterial. The emergency vehicle is granted the left turn signal and straight through green lights unimpeded through the intersection. I think that's a critical area that we always look like to look at. Obviously, preemption, you can set up your traffic signal controllers however you want. We generally always recommend pulling the left turn green as well, because then the fire, uh, the, the driver of the vehicle knows that everybody is brought safely to a halt. And he can turn left, go straight, turn right. He has all options available to him. The unique benefit of Glance's cellular communication is that it provides miles of range regardless of the topography. And if you have a look there, all of these vehicles here are already stopped. So you know that you've already caused that preemption um, to happen over there. So you're very far away. All of these vehicles ahead of you are going to get go through that signal unimpeded, and everybody else is already brought safely to a halt. So that's a key aspect behind using the cellular communication that gives you this huge additional distance that you can get out of the system. Standard radio-based preemption systems typically are unable to deliver enough range to provide a green light before the emergency vehicle arrives at the signalized. And if you look here, we, you see how it's going into a corner? Um, this is where cellular really takes, takes onto its own. 
the radio communication can't go through the trees and buildings and things like that. So as you're going around a corner, and the same with optical, optical can't do around the corner. So when you're driving towards this next signal, having the cellular communication with GPS intersections. is, because is a the lot more accurate. system uses GPS and cellular communications, the intersections that are around the corner and over the hill respond as efficiently as intersections with clear line of sight. And you can see we've already brought all of these people to a halt. The result is improved travel times and safer responses. Now, when we demoing this, when you've got a demo corridor installed, um, what's quite nice is whenever we do these demos, we normally have travel safely installed along the demo corridor and we have preemption. So when you're driving in your own vehicle and you've got a vehicle test box and you're showcasing preemption to people, Travel Safely actually has a great way of showing people when the preemption actually hits the signal ahead because you can see the timers from the signal going from 40 plus seconds, you know, 30 plus seconds, and then all of a sudden it goes five plus seconds. That's when the preempt hits because obviously now it's going through its minimum clearance timers. So it's a great way of also showing the distances you can get by using cellular-based preemption. Added benefit to Glance's cellular communication is the first ever Travel Safely smartphone app that warns motorists emergency vehicle approaching from behind. And, and that's obviously the Travel Safely aspect behind this. Uh, the fire department loved this. Every single time we've demonstrated this to the fire department, it's just a major step up from what they've been expecting. And they always have seen this, uh, you know, in all their vehicles as how do we alert the public? They just don't drive very well. They don't hear us coming. They don't move out the way. This gives them a clear vision of what the future could look like. The system works quite simply. When the emergency vehicle begins the run and activates the lights and siren, the Glant system begins to broadcast vehicle details over cellular and redundant 900 megahertz radio. The Glant's in cabinet equipment calculates when the emergency vehicle should arrive at the intersection. The in cabinet unit fits in the common styles of controller cabinets and monitors dozens of circuits. The in vehicle unit has a small footprint and provides circuits to connect GPS, cellular, and 900 megahertz antennas as well as power, activation, turn signals, and auto cutoff circuits that are typically wired into parking brakes and door switches. Glance uses Google Maps allowing users to see map details. This is the aerial view of the emergency runs documented earlier in this video. The fire station is very close to the first intersection, so it's critical to request the green light as quickly as possible. As we pan back, you can see more intersection locations that were programmed to begin cycling to green to allow the queue of traffic to move forward ahead of the emergency vehicle. Another feature of the Glant system is the ability to analyze each emergency run. The colors show the trail and reveal specific details about what the communication particulars were during the emergency run. A simple click on the beginning point reveals vehicle and time details that started at about 9.38 a.m. The end point also shows the vehicle and time details. This vehicle had a travel time of almost two and a half minutes when the call was automatically disabled upon arrival. The ultimate value of using cellular and GPS technologies are gathering granular details about every time the vehicle moves. This report shows 150 month-to-date service trips where lights and sirens or code 3 runs are shown. Key items accumulating measurement like total travel time and total distance traveled all these elements calculate an average travel time of 4 minutes and 11 seconds on 101 trips, which are just the ones over a half mile in distance. This report shows the average distance on runs that were 2.3 miles at nearly 30 miles per hour. I'm going to stop it over there. This video is a great way of explaining it to people. Obviously, we've got presentations that go through the same kind of uh, things that you can talk through. But if you've only got, you know, three minutes and 38 seconds to, you know, to show it, you can play this video. It allows the guys to understand what's, you know, what's available in there. And obviously, the, the presentations have a little bit more detail of it. For this training session, I wanted to go through Glance and 
how everything sort of works uh, within Glance. So I'm going to open up my browser over here. And currently we logged into the city of Odessa, Texas. Um, this is quite a new installation, but a very, very active um, fire department here. And what you can see is all the intersections over here. And you can see all of these lines that are drawn along here. And this is where the vehicles have been within the last one hour. So if you want to see what that means, you can also go. They've got their standard viewers um, as satellite. You can also turn on, you know, just the normal Google map layer. And you can see all of these are idle. Most of these are idle runs besides this little segment over here, which is an in-service run. These are all layers on top of the map. So we can also, for the fire vehicle, if we want, we can also go back further in time. So we can go say, well, what did he do for the last three hours? And we can hit that little arrow button. And now it's going to go calculate what happened in the last three hours. And you can see there were a couple of additional other trips over here that happened uh, within the last three hours. So they can actually see exactly in a live view where all these vehicles have driven. And you can see they do, they're do quite an active um, community of vehicles here driving around in the city. And you can change these settings. You can also set your defaults differently um, under your edit profile. If you want to see just the last one hour or you want to see more than one hour, you can do that. I'm going to go into playback in a little bit um, so we can see what each vehicle has done. Um, but I first just want to go and navigate through here and show you some of the other features. So when we're looking through all of these, you can see obviously the icons on the map for all of these emergency vehicles and where they're located. If you zoom into the map, you'll see they've got a number of different icons over here. And I'm going to log into a different system a little later uh, where we've just added new functionality that you can change what types of vehicles are in each station. So, you know, often you've got a ladder truck or you've got a pumper, or you've got an EMT vehicle. Uh, so you've got multiple different types of vehicles in the fire station. We can actually have different icons now for the different types of vehicles. Um, so if you give us, hey, Odessa Fire T6 uh, is a uh, you know is a ladder truck, fine. We make it a ladder truck. Or if it's an EMT, we can make the icon an EMT. Just that's new functionality that's just come out in the last uh, couple of weeks, basically. Um, you can click. Anywhere you want on a on a device, like a fire truck, and it'll tell you, hey, this is the information coming back from him. His in-service is off. His key on is off, so his vehicle is off. Uh, his left turn is off, so he's just parked at the moment. You can also click on this guy and see if there's any information coming back from him, and he's also off at the moment. But it also allows you to click on the trails on the map. So I can click on the trail here. And at 10.06, and granted, this is central time, so that was, you know, 10 minutes ago, <clears throat> they had an emergency run that the key was on and the preempt re active request was on. So you can see that he was <clears throat> running preemption uh, for, that, for that call, and we can actually go and see where he went in this live view right now so i can zoom out here and we can just track where he drove by just scrolling up with him and he came up down there actually it's easier if i zoom out i suppose and you can see that vehicle is actually all the way, that was that emergency vehicle trip. He actually went all the way here. So that this vehicle was also based at that station there. And there are two vehicles that responded to this incident. One from here, one from another direction. So, and it looks like they've gone to the school. 
So that's probably why they sent multiple different vehicles. Someone pulled the school alarm bell. Um, and this, you know, you can see down here exactly when the vehicles disabled their request. So you can see the little blue over here. That's when he's turned off his emergency lights. Okay, that's when the request is still on. But so you've got all this data available here. You can also look at the each individual truck and you can see that's rescue six, Odessa Fire Rescue Six. Okay, what did he do today? You can click on the playback and we can click on Odessa Rescue Six. And we can go for today. Let's just start it at 8 a.m. in the morning till now and you can hit play and there's the vehicle driving wherever he drove at that period of time and you got little controls over here if you want it to go faster slower oh it's a bit fast there he's driving wherever he's driving. So you can really track exactly what that vehicle's doing wherever he's going. And we'll see what he does when he starts driving out. Now he's driven back to the station. He went to the Winwood Town Center. And this is when that emergency trip happened. So you can actually see the exact path that he went from the fire station back along here all the way down to the school. So you can track absolutely everything for these vehicles, which is great for the fire department when they want to have a look at some of that kind of stuff. You can also go into the each fire vehicle and we can scroll. We can either click on the vehicle itself or we can look at the vehicle here on the left hand view. And we can go to that same Rescue 6 vehicle. And we can go look at the vehicle details. And you can see this graph over here is showing that this is a very, very active vehicle. All of these days, he's really active. You can see this is when disable switches are on. He had his emergency trip this morning when he was in service. So you can see all the details coming back from that. and. When you want to go into, you can see his key is on right now, but he's, he's not in service. So he's still at the site. He's running his car, but he hasn't, his uh, emergency lights are not on at the moment. And his system is disabled. So he's got his uh, uh, handbrake on. So all of that kind of detail is there. You can also click in more details, and it's going to go into information about that fire vehicle to show you a lot of information when he was in service, left turn, key on, uh, key on, left turn is not on right now, and the disable is on right now. And you can see over here he turned his left turn to turn ar across the street. So you're getting all of this um, detail coming back that you can export the detail. Um, similar to the school beacon, we also show each individual latitude and longitude. You can see what version of software is running on the emergency apparatus as well and the signal cell strength. The other thing to go to is a intersection. So we can go, you can click on an intersection on the map or you can click on it on the left hand side and it'll bring up information for that traffic signal. And you can see we're looking at the AC voltage cabinet temperature, BBS if they have one connected, humidity, internal battery, the conflict monitor information if they've got it hooked up as well. And on the right-hand side here, you're looking at when the preamps were active, your AC voltage, cabinet temperature, humidity in the cabinet, BBS. So you can look at all of that kind of data that's available. And I can see from this cabinet that actually they don't have a BBS set up. So we should probably change the device type on this unit because we don't need to show anything on BBS if they don't have one hooked up. But it's giving you a lot of information over here in terms of uh, the cabinet fan is off at the moment. 
the preem status is okay the network status is all good so we're getting a lot of information back here and one of the key things with the glance preemption system is it's not just preemption it's also intersection cabinet monitoring and it's also pass through communication it's also travel safely so and I'm not going to go over all of those things in this in this uh, presentation. We'll go over one of those in another in another presentation. Is there are four major things that uh, the cabinet unit does? And the first one is this basic monitoring. When do you have a power failure? When is your cabinet going to flash? When did someone open the door? All of the monitoring aspects behind it. The second thing is preemption and priority, what we're showing right now. The preemption and priority using GPS based preemption that's available. The third thing is pass through communication. So every single signal that now has the uh, Glance cabinet unit <coughs> provides remote communication for your uh, tactics or um, traffic wear system, ATMS.now, or your Econolite Centrax system. Any one of the intersections that does not have fiber now has remote communication. So you can now do, um, you can now connect into the traffic signals, you can do remote front panel, you can do controller uploads and downloads. So that's one of the other areas that the unit gets installed. Um, and the fourth thing is travel safely. So now you've got travel safely, which is a connected vehicle application. And what's great with this is all of that functionality comes as standard, whether the person buys it for monitoring, whether he buys it for pass through preemption or travel safely, all of those functions are just available with the unit. So what it means is when you're competing with anyone else, all of these functions come for free and they can upgrade or use them whenever they want. Um, but it's, it, it's a great selling feature that they're not just getting preemption, they're getting so much more. They're getting all of this other functionality as well, which is key behind the whole Glant system. When you want to go in here and you want to go into more details about a device, so... For instance, the alarms generally alarm when you get a power failure, uh, when your cabinet goes into flash, when your battery backup kicks on, uh, when your battery backup battery goes low. Um, and you can set up alarms for pretty much anything you want. If you want to get alarmed when the network status isn't good, you can set up another alarm. But what we generally do is we, we err on the side of less alerts rather than too many. I've spoken to a number of clients that have like the the Intellight system and the guy gets 250 emails a day. So it all goes into his junk inbox and he never reads them. What we're trying to do is provide alerts and alarms when you have an AC failure or the cabinet goes into flash, things that you can really action on. And obviously with the internal battery inside of our unit, you can monitor when the power fails because we're powering up the modem and we can check the actual raw AC voltage coming in. So if we go into more details here, this is also going to give you the raw information of, inf of all the details coming in from the traffic signal controller itself. Um, and you can see um, over here, the cabinet temperature. The, this is actually an emergency vehicle trip coming through. And you can see their vehicle number 6360 came through at 10.07. And the distance away from the signal and the ETA that was him moving away from the signal, what rule he was in, uh, what preempt active he caused. So there's a lot of raw data here. Great. Most people don't like to look at raw data, but it allows us as technicians to look in through the system and see what's happened um, we can also see the green sense what phases were active over here um, but all of that you know great information but you know what we like to do is is 
make all of this information very easy, readable information that people actually understand. And the way that we do that is through reports. So there's a number of different reports available um, on the system where we can go into reports. And there, there are three different options here. I'm going to look at the first option, report viewer. And I'm going to open it up in another tab. I always like to open it up in another tab. It allows me to quickly go backwards and forwards from one to the other. So what this is going to show us is the first thing you're going to see is all of what we call the graph comparisons. We looked at this when we were doing the school beacons. So we can open up all the AC uh, voltage reports for all of these intersections. And you can see this is obviously some intersection that, that hasn't been fully installed as they've just bought new units. Over here, this is what a power failure looks like. That's what a little brownout looks like. That's kind of dirty power coming into the intersection. This is normal. This is great looking power coming in here. That's a short power failure event. Short power failure event. This is a, is a brownout with a power failure event over here. And what you can do with all of this as well is you can then say, well, you know, which, which intersections look bad? Are there intersections that have problems a lot? Um, and you can see generally most of their um, intersections don't look too bad. But what you'll see with this is because we're monitoring the power every tenth of a second, you can see these little events like we're seeing, you know, the power sort of being quite jagged over here, just kind of a bit of dirty power. You probably find that their grounding isn't the best at that signal. Go out there, reground the signal, call the utility company, ask them to reground it. Um, if you get long power failure events, you'll see those kind of things. But one of the interesting things that we've seen from analyzing all the data is about 90% of failures of traffic signals are AC power failure events. It's the biggest problem that most people are having at their traffic signals, and no one is monitoring at the moment because none of the traffic signal controllers are capable of monitoring that in real time because they don't have built-in batteries. Um, so, you know, there's another one with a little failure over there. So you've got all of this data that's available to look at um, at all of these signals. We can also look at one of the other ones I like to look at is the preemption active status. And what this does is it shows you all your signals and which ones are the most active. And, you know, in terms of, so this one's had zero preempts. Maybe it's new or maybe the preempt hasn't been wired in correctly at this signal. Could be. Uh, or maybe it's just at an area where no emergency vehicles drive through. Uh, but it allows you to look at all this data to see, you know, which, you know, a lot of traffic signal uh, people, well, you know, so many preemption events. When you look here, you've got one, two events happening there. Maybe this over here is about six or seven events in a day. But there's not a huge, huge number of events that some people think there are. This is a very, very active city. I will tell you that in, in emergency vehicle preemption runs. So you've got all of this data that's available. You've also got information in terms of um, each individual vehicle. So we can look at what are the vehicles look like. You can see that this vehicle is not very active. And these might not be, yeah, these aren't installed yet. These, these vehicles here are installed. And you can see how often they're driving around. Um, so it gives you a great way of just seeing. I, I like to use this to see whether the vehicles are installed, not installed. or And, and this is kind of the case is a lot of these aren't installed because it's a brand new system here that they've just added in a whole bunch of new vehicles that they purchased about a month ago. You can also look at the intersection health report, which shows you the health of all the intersections. This is one of the intersections that's had a power failure within the last three days. 
Same with this intersection. Um, so you can see exactly what's happening on all of the different intersections. You can see which ones. This network status is mainly set up for travel safely. So we can see when it says all good, it means all of the travel safely information is coming through. Um, and here, no ping, it means the IP addresses aren't set up correctly. Here, no Ethernet, hasn't been plugged into Ethernet. So it's a quick way of just looking what's working on all your signals. Here, it's saying no SPAT because the SPAT data isn't coming through. And as I said, this is a brand new system that they're just busy installing a lot of these new devices. So it's a quick way of looking at everything for, the, for what you have installed. The report that I really like is the one design for the fire department. And this is quite an interesting report. First of all, the fire department loves this. Uh, the reason why they like this, this is a report that shows them from the 1st of December to the 12th of December, month to date, what's been happening. They've done 2,000 on their 18 vehicles that they have, currently connected, they have done 2,649 trips. And an idle trip is a trip where they don't have emergency lights on. And the vehicles are utilized for 20% of their time on idle trips. That's them driving around to the shops, going back from events, all of that kind of information. In other words, when they're just driving around. And it gives you the total amount of time, 963 hours of driving around, a total of 6,027 miles that they've driven, just idling around, and 14 miles is the average speed. Now, what this one does is Odessa Fire came to us, and the standard report normally just has service trips. They came to us and they said, you know what? We do mutual aid calls, and our ISO ratings are affected quite badly because we provide mutual aid to all the outlying communities. And what we find is on our um, computer aided dispatch system, it shows that we've got an average response time of around about five minutes. But you know, that's because we're doing all these longer distance trips. And our ISO rating gets docked because it's showing that we take longer. So what we did was we implemented something which is all of the service trips within their city limit. And how that's done is they sent us their um, map files of what's within their city limits. You know, they all have like a GIS mapping program. And so they sent us their GIS mapping uh, limits. And we created this report to look at how many trips were within the city limits. So they've done 659 trips within the city limits and the total time, the total distance, and their average response time is three minutes and 46 seconds for those trips. Now, you'll see that these two numbers don't line up, 659 and 429. And the reason for that is we look at all the trips greater than half a mile because what happens is a lot of the fire departments, almost all of them, test their trucks in the morning or in the afternoon, turn their lights on, and we want to discard those events that they testing their lights to make sure everything works. Their average distance they traveled was 2.1 miles, and their average speed is 32 miles an hour. That's a pretty good response time for all of their vehicles, three minutes and 46 seconds. That's really good. But then they've got all their out of service trips, which is their average response time is six minutes and 57 seconds, almost seven minutes. And you can see that's because they travel six miles on those trips. And you can also see the average speed is a lot higher because they're traveling a further distance. So, Having this available provides the city with a way of tracking their response times for their ISO within the city and also looking at what they're doing as mutual aid calls. All of these are mutual aid calls. They're spending quite a bit of their time doing mutual aid calls. Then we look at the summary. 
uh, for the 90th percentile within the city limits. It's one of the other things they want to track for, excuse me, for um, the ISO ratings. That's the basically the 10% of the trips that are much further away than um, – you know, their the, the longest 10% of the trips, what was the average response time for those, which is five minutes and 31 seconds, which is still pretty good. And you can see there it's normally 3.29 miles versus the 2.1. Now, one of the other things that you get on this is a heat map, which is where all the vehicles are being going out at what times. So you can see, for instance, here, they had 11 emergency vehicle uh, trips within that one hour on Monday the 3rd at one, at, from 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock. They had 11 trips. So it's a way of looking at how active your fire department is at certain times to then come back and say, well, you know, for the fire chief, when do we need to staff our facilities better? And obviously, you know, during the day from seven till seven is their busiest period of the time. You can also scroll down and it will go in for each individual vehicle over here, Odessa Fire uh, Engine 11, and it's color coded and... Forgive me because I'm colorblind, so I don't see the difference between them. I can see it's a different shade. Uh, this is, I believe, within city limits. One of them is within city limits and the other one's without city, uh, outside of city limits uh, when they're traveling outside city limits. And you can scroll down and see every, every trip that an emergency vehicle made. Um, and you can see his summary for engine 11. His average response time is 2 minutes and 44. So he's better than most of the other trucks, you know, on average. But you can see this is where he went out. He went out seven times during nine and then another seven times over here. I don't know what happened there, but we can always go back to the playback and have a look at that. And then you'll see engine 60. So you can go through this report and look at every single vehicle and delve down right into the details of each individual vehicle. You can even go in and say, all right, so on this trip, where did he start the trip? And this will open up a Google map view of the physical start point. That's where he started it. And this is where he ended the trip. So where he went over here. Uh, so that's where he turned off his lights. So you can track all of that kind of information quite quickly, or you can go into engine number 16 and go look at December the 11th and track where you went from uh, 1234 to 1237. Uh, it just gives you a lot of information that you can look at. And this is, this is a great, you know, great report for, you know, the fire chief to look at exactly what all of his, uh, all of these vehicles are doing, but also an overall summary of all of these vehicles, what they've done for month to date and the previous month. Um, one of the other reports over here, which is designed mainly for the traffic engineers and ourselves, is all the different emergency vehicle trips that they that the vehicles have done through the signals. So this is for uh, 10th and West County, Odessa Fire Engine 16 went through there at 12.34 on December the 13th. And you can see this is when the first the event first came in, was 2,536 feet away. But his ETA was 111 seconds. Now, as most of you guys know, our preemption is all ETA-based. So estimated time of arrival when the vehicle is coming towards the signal. But when there's traffic congestion and the vehicle speed slows down below 24 miles an hour, it's configurable, it will cause an early print. And that's what's happened at the signal over here. 
So you'll see that he came in and he was 2,500 feet away, which is quite a distance, but his speed was only 16 uh, miles an hour. So what that means is we caused an early preempt to flush out the traffic. And you can see here, 16 miles an hour, then at 2,400 feet, he was speeding up, and that was five seconds later. Um, so now you've flushed out the traffic ahead, and the way that they program the signals, two and six, active at the same time. This is just what they've done at the, their signals there. And you can see 43 seconds later, that's when he cleared the signal. That was the clear cleared uh, response over there, or sometimes it goes 255. Um, so that's when he drove through. You'll also see over here that he had both radio and cell communication coming in at that first signal. And he had uh, both them here. He had radio only right when he was close at the signal for some reason. And then he had um, both signals coming through here. That's great. It means everything's wired in perfectly at those signals. Um, you know, you can scroll down and look at any of the sort of the signals and, and look at what they've done through all the different signals um, to see what's affecting them, which preempts have happened, which vehicle went through. You can track each and every single one of them. You know, here the similar kind of thing came in. Uh, phase number eight was active there. Then he pulled uh, preempt number two. This is when the preempt kicked in on the actual traffic controller to cause preempt number four and eight to be active at the same time, which means it was an eight second clearance time for that signal to go to four and eight, the way that they've programmed their signals. Um, and then basically the total event was 41 seconds long at that signal. Gives you, it gives the traffic engineer a lot of information to delve into uh, what's happening at each individual call that's come into the traffic signal. No one looks at this, only looks at this when something goes wrong. This is the way of us quickly, all of us looking at this and understanding what's going on. Maybe they programmed the wrong um, phases. So you can look at all this kind of data. This is why it's critical to wire in the green sense because now we know which phases were active, how long the clearance time was. If you don't wire in green phases, you're not gonna get this information. And it also shows you whether or not the cell and the radio are wired in as well, and whether or not, depending on the topography of the intersection, whether the cell and radio is good at that signal, or if you're mainly getting cell reception at that particular signal. Like this signal over here is mainly getting cell reception. Obviously, there must be a topography there that causes the radio not to work, or potentially the radio isn't connected in here correctly. It's a lot of data to go through, but it gives you a lot of nice information. Now, these reports are always evolving. When someone asks us for new features like, hey, can we have out of service trips? Well, that sounds like a great idea, sure. You know, we'll go and develop these, uh, these additional features. Majority of the fire departments uh, don't do mutual aid, so a lot of them aren't really interested in that information. Fine, then they just get the standard report without this out of service uh, line item over here. We just need to know, you know, that you guys just need to know that option is available. Um, some of the new reports that we also have coming out, we had we were meeting with the city of uh, Lawrence, uh, Kansas. And one of the things they said was, we would love to know whether or not our drivers are using their indicators. Because a lot of these rules are set up where the drivers, if they turn on their left turn indicator, it preempts the next intersection to the left. But if the driver doesn't use his indicator, well, obviously it's not gonna preempt the intersection to the left earlier. Also, the fire chief wants, you know, their standard operating procedures is use your indicators. And some people don't. So we've created a new report, which will be coming out pretty soon, which is looking at each individual vehicle, um, you know, for a period of time that will look at the number of intersections that he went through, the number of uh, cell preemption events, the number of 
radio preemption events, how many times he had his priority on, disable, left turn, and right turn indicators. And interestingly enough, you can see he did, uh, he went through 28 intersections on the 8th, but he only used his indicator once. Probably means he's just not using it very often. Because when I go down here and I look at this engine 56, well, he uses his indicators all the time. And this is that information that the fire department wanted to know was which different vehicles are using their indicators correctly and not. Because it's indicative of, um, you know, that group of people within that station just not using their indicators. So that was just, it was something that they wanted to know about. And now it's uh, something that we're tracking that allows us to look at that kind of data over there to tell you whether or not they're using their indicators. It was so these are the kind of things always to keep your ears on the ground in terms of when you talk to the fire chiefs. Um, you know, what, what are the new, what other features do you think we're missing? What would you like to see? We're collecting all this data um, and we create these reports. It doesn't cost them anything, but we think this is a great thing, another sellable feature for us. So we create these reports based on their requests so we can make the overall product better and better and better. I'm going to slow down there for a second and open up to anybody that has any questions at the moment in terms of, you know, uh, some of the things that I've been showing. If anyone has any questions, you can write it in the chat or you can um, ask the questions. Just turn your mic on and, and ask a question and I'll. I'll get to trying to answer some of your questions. All right. Uh, Leah, is there something that you can log in and see stuff? Um, yeah, I can't. Uh, I, you, there, there is and there isn't. Um, in other words, what we'll do is we'll provide, in other words, you can, you can log into certain systems where you can get a view only and see some of that information. But, um, you know, generally the best thing to do is once you've got a couple of units, like you guys have got units installed on, uh, on the big island, you can just log in there and see exactly, um, how much data is available there on the big island when they're driving through and you can see all of their different rules that they've created. So, you know, um, I actually don't know what the login is for, for that, but I can look at it and, you know, you, you can log in and you can see, um, you can see exactly what, what's going on, how you've programmed the rules and things like that. What I'm going to do over here is, Log into Quincy, and you can look at rules that they've created. And this is a new demo system that's gone out, and you can see they've programmed in all these different rules for preemption. And what's important to know is when you're in a rule, so this north uh, or southbound approach, um, this is the box that they've drawn for that. So when the vehicles are driving down this direction towards the signal um, and they're within a ETA of 35 seconds, it's then going to call preempt number two and it's moving towards the signal. You've got a um, maximum duration of a preempt event. You've got a ETA. Uh, disable so if someone drops below 27 miles an hour towards that signal because of traffic congestion it pulls the preempt early less than the 35 ETA that we saw in that one device what's also quite key with the system that's quite a lot different to uh, optical preemption and other preemption systems is we have a very very short clearance event 
when the person is 30 feet past the signal from the center of the signal, it stops the preemption request and puts the, the traffic controller back. Most of the optical systems had about a 15 second timeout. So you would have the signal still in preempt and the vehicle is 15 seconds away from there before it goes into normal operation. When you're driving through our system, you'll actually see as you're driving through, and if you look back, you'll see that signal go, as you pass through it, it'll start going back into normal operation. Um, so there's a lot of different information available there. We normally pre-configure these signals for you. So if you guys, uh, you know, we normally ask you to send us the phasing information, uh, sorry, not the, the, the preempt. So northbound, you're going to tell us it's preempt number two. Um, southbound, you're going to tell us that it's preempt number three. And the eastbound approach is preempt number four. So, you know, we go through each of these different rules so that you can tell us exactly which preempt to, to call based on the way that the city does it. We'll draw map files as best we know how to. And then when you're done in the field, that's when you'll go in and you'll go and do edits in terms of doing drive testing. So key aspect behind the commissioning process of this is to do uh, preemption drive testing that allows you to test each of these. And, and you can, because this is a web-based utility, you can log in from anywhere and make any edits to these rules whenever you want. Any, uh, how long does it take? Uh, do you have a general idea of how long it takes to populate the owner's data given X amount of trucks? So we, uh, these reports that we do, um, like this report over here, we generally run these for the previous day of events. So they run early in the morning and it gives you all of the events for the previous day. So he can now see everything for the previous day and see all of that information that's available. Um, you've obviously got all of this data and yeah, it, it, it's you looking at generally sort of a, a month today or the previous month of data and then checking the differences between them all. All right. Any other questions? Oh, meant for setup and installation. Sorry, Leah. Uh, it takes about um, an experienced person to install an intersection. In hour, two, two hours, somewhere around there. Hour, two hours would be my guess. You can do it a lot quicker, uh, depending on um, you know, depending on on what you know, what, what the knowledge is. Your first intersection generally takes a little longer and also depends on, on uh, if you're doing travel safely at the same time as well. That also takes a little bit of extra time because you're setting it up. Uh, William, yes, what controllers are compatible? Pretty much every traffic controller supports preemption. Uh, even the old 170s support preemption. Uh, so you able to connect up to almost any traffic signal controller and our controller has our outputs for the preempt have got two options. Either you've got a solid output, which is for high priority preemption or pulsed output, which is for, uh, I think it pulses at like eight Hertz, which is for the priority request. Travel safely when we go into the connected vehicle side. Uh, on the next um, training course that we do in connected vehicles, I'm going to be going over how you know which controllers support uh, SPAT messaging and which versions of software you need in each controller to support SPAT messaging, and also go into some of the details of how you actually program controllers to actually do connected vehicles and, and how it all works with the with the travel safety app. So on preemption, pretty much most of the controllers in the last 20 years, maybe longer, support preemption requests.
Any other questions that anybody has? All right, well, uh, barring any other questions, I'm not gonna take up any more of your time. Uh, we finished about five minutes early on this one. If anyone has any questions or anything like that, give me a shout anytime. We'll also be making this uh, recording available on the on our YouTube channel uh, so that you can see exactly what we went over and go back and showcase this to anybody else that, that wants to get some of this training. So thank you very much, everybody. Really appreciate your time. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye.